Well, I am really pleased to welcome back to the studio Roy Snell, where we're going to continue the discussion about his new book, The Accidental Compliance Professional. And Roy, today we're going to talk about compliance independence, compliance activism, <laughs> how to help others, and most importantly, what's next for Roy? Wonderful. All right. Looking forward to it. So let's start with independence. <laughs> and I know this is a subject that's a very big part of our compliance discourse. As I once heard Donna Bohm share, it's critical for a compliance leader to have a line of sight into the entire business. And I think we agree and we've talked about how there's a lot more to risk than what we might think of as traditional risk areas. That a discussion about objectives, incentives, and resources, well, that's also a risk discussion, and that should include the input mm -hmm. of compliance leaders. But Roy, given the evolution of the compliance function, including the DOJ's published evaluation of corporate compliance programs, which spells it all out in case anybody missed the memo. Mm -hmm. I mean, Roy, why are we still having this conversation? I actually, <laughs> I, I, it's a great question. And I actually uh, think about this from time to time as many of the things I'm discussing in interviews like this, uh, I can remember discussing 23 years ago. Uh, the good news is, is we're in a way better place than okay. we were. 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago and one year ago. Uh, there's a lot to this. I want to buzz through a few of them okay. pretty quickly. And one of them, to begin with the independence, our, you have to ask yourself a question. There's an important question you, ask, you should ask yourself on a regular basis as a compliance professional. Why was our profession created? Because that's our mission. That's why we're here. And if we don't do this, we'll be a cost center, not right. an effective part of the organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I believe that the uh, reason why we're here is because those who came before us failed. Right. So far, my point is inarguable. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> How they failed. They all are. Yeah. <laughs> According to me. Uh, the, the, the more difficult question to ask is how did people before us fail to the point in which okay. society said we need a, a whole new near C-suite uh, profession C right out of nowhere. This rarely happens. And uh, they failed because of their conflicts of interest. They uh, didn't want to fix a problem because they wanted to be promoted and didn't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. They didn't want to fix a problem because they wanted revenue to stay where it was at and this fix might hurt revenue. Uh, they didn't want to fix a problem because it would happen on their watch and they would look bad. Uh, so I believe the number one thing we always have to remember is, is for that reason and the mere fact that you, you know, you, you just can't prevent, find, and fix problems if you also are responsible for revenue or also right. responsible for the organization's reputation. Or uh, you have to just look at things literally. Is it right? It's wrong. If it's wrong, we got to fix it. And uh, these sort of things. Independence couldn't be more important for the effectiveness of a compliance program. I agree with Donald Bohm and many others that we, we need a seat at the table. We need to be around when the bad idea is being discussed right. or they, they go off on a new uh, uh, thing like we're going to hire a new third party uh, vendor. Mm -hmm. And I will say, be sure to check their, their efforts uh, to, to comply with the rule of law because if shortly after you start outsourcing to them, they get in trouble, it, it, it could lead uh, to yeah. investigations of us, uh, third-party compliance is a real important thing. You're in the room, you see it happening as it as it unfolds, as opposed to two years later when it's too late. Yeah. Be in the room. What I disagree with a lot of people on is when they start talking about getting involved in uh, bonuses and incentives. Uh, there's plenty of bright compliance people who would disagree with me on this. Uh, 
in, in, in getting into otherwise getting into operations. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're qualified to tell business anything other than what they're about to do is either unethical or illegal. And we need to think just a little bit longer for a, a better way around this particular issue. Would you add to that or could have negative consequences? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, let's talk about bonuses real quickly. Uh, it's a great example. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was told uh, your bon your sales incentives were the reason why people set up bogus bank accounts, right. and so you should get rid of the sales incentives. I 100% clear-mindedly totally disagree. The incentives didn't cause the cheating. Okay. People chose to cheat. Cheating is a choice, and you and I have talked about that and blogged thought, about it. I kind of thought you might agree with me on yes. that. I say to leadership, do whatever bonus incentives you want. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to slip in a couple that are ethically, uh, related sure. to ethics and compliance. Are they supportive? Are they attending the sessions? Mm -hmm. You know, there's an organization that just says, if you don't do these five or six things, you won't get your bonus. Right. And calculate your bonus any way you want. But before you do that, you have to prove to have been an ethical and compliant individual. Yeah. I think the Department of Justice did a good job in that recent memo where they said, Are, is the organization just thinking about the compliance implications of their incentives? And I think that's a broad yeah. way to look at it and a good way to look at we, it. I want, I want to get back to this a little bit here. We need to blame the proper problem. Right. There were hundreds of people who all had the same bonus structure at Wells Fargo. And they all didn't cheat right. to achieve their goals. Some people worked hard enough to achieve their goals and got their bonus. Some, so the bonus, by definition, is not the problem. Some people, either through a lack of ability or an ambition or an ethical character or integrity, chose to cheat to get to their bonus. If you blame the bonus and not the, the person who chose to cheat, you're not going to fix the problem. Right. You're not looking within. So I just want to summarize by saying we're not here to run the company. We're here to slip in ethical behavior and, and compliant activity as uh, uh, s seamlessly as possible. Right. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about compliance activism. <laughs> what is a compliance activist? And Roy, is that a good thing? Yeah. And, yeah actually, <laughs> I, I think you, you said... An, some of the notes we traded before this, that it was activism is a good thing. And why are you calling activism a bad thing? It sounds good. Well, I, I, I think our country was founded on activism, <laughs> uh, depending on how you define the term. I want to give you uh, kudos. Uh, let, I'm going to spin something. This is not true. Okay. Okay. But if I were to put something in the book, to trigger a question in the interviews that I would take part in after the book was written, this wouldn't have been, this would have been it. Right. I didn't, I wasn't that smart. But when I got done with the book, I looked back and I thought, should I have used that word? And, and for me, the answer is yes, and I'll explain, yeah. I'll explain why. Others, because it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive, yeah. and others others might object. Hopefully not after my explanation. <laughs> but um, So what say you? Well, uh, I think the term is right at the moment uh, sensitive, and it's being used uh, uh, a little bit different way than maybe 10 years ago. But uh, I'm, I define activists, uh, activism in the, t the way that I use the term is making a lot of noise to bring to light a horrible problem that is so uh, ingrained in our culture that only screaming and jumping up and down and yeah. running up and down the streets with a, your hair on fire, we, ha we have to do that to fix it. Some people define activism that way. That, that's, that's not how uh, 
it, it's just not how compliance professionals should go about their business. Let me, let me try explaining it this yeah. way. There are three kinds of compliance professionals. Those who see a problem and quite often run away um, and, and are afraid. Okay. And then there are those who get it right as often as humanly possible and do it with high and emotional IQ. And then there's a group of people who run up in the hall, down the hall every day with their hair on fire complaining about every little thing. Yeah. I got a call from a colleague, of, a guy I used to work with at Mayo. 15 years later or so, he calls me out of the blue and says, I, I just became CEO of a big hospital. A compliance officer reports to me, she's in my office every other day I know that the general principle is that she, she should report to the leadership with the good board, but I, I can't do this. It's driving me crazy. I said, I said to him, I thought, you know, you really got to be careful because it could send the wrong message if one of the first things you do sure. is change that change. reporting relationship. But he had a, a problem on his hand is that this individual was making a big deal out of every little thing. To me, that's activist. That's an activist. That's yeah. an activist. Um, I described uh, earlier uh, uh, in a discussion with you that I would not hesitate, hopefully I never would have to, going to the board and saying, we have to fix, I've talked to everybody I can right. all the way up the chain. They won't do it, I have to fix this. Uh, we have to fix this. If you don't fix this, I'm making a noisy exit. I would consider that a pretty activist statement or action. But you, you, you have to let go of some little things sometimes. Right. And what I was saying, uh, talking about in that lesson was, you don't want to be afraid. You don't want to crawl back under your desk after making some weak little effort. And you also don't want to run up and down the hall with your hair on fire all the time. You want to hit the middle. Yeah. Uh, with a high emotional IQ and some things we've talked about earlier, interpersonal skills, the ability to collaborate, compromise, motivate. The word activism to me doesn't really focus on those things. And, and we don't need it in our profession. So it's almost <clears throat> as just as important as the decision of what you escalate is the importance of the decision of what you don't escalate. You know, and, and that's that's a real tough part of the job. You know, you you worry if I let this go, will I be deemed weak or right. part of the problem? Um, another way to put it might be is just apply the right amount of what you're going to do to something. If it's a small problem, address it in a right. smaller way. Believe me, I've gotten many a calls as CEO of HCCA and SEC uh, during a 17 and a half year period from somebody who went on f for 30 minutes about how everything was horrible and every solution I gave them was no good. They tried it. Nobody in their company is ever going to listen. And they just described this activist mentality, which again, to fix problems with society that are ingrained in it about poor treatment of certain people, for example, you've got to run up and down the hall with your hair on fire. Right. Thousands of people do. But as a compliance professional, that's rarely, uh, I'm smiling now because I've actually used this on occasion. I, I, there is an exception. I have done this as CEO and as a compliance officer. Well, I will feign a just a whole bunch of outrage over some little thing. And people will look at me, and, look, and what I'm saying is, you know, I don't do this for every little thing, but every once in a while I show you that I take this very seriously. Right. Sorry, I went, I went a little long on those, but this no, is, this is really tricky stuff. And, and a lot of compliance books don't cover this. Here's how to audit, here's how to monitor, right. here's how to set up a hotline, here's the rule of law, or here's how to build an ethical culture. There's a whole lane of this job that heretofore has not been addressed. And I addressed it with some very strange stories and lessons. Yeah. And, and I really didn't expect uh, it to work as well as I think it's working. Right now, I've got a, a, one person 
who's using it to uh, their plans book club. To, to, they're going to oh, the neat. lesson. Yeah, it's, it's so fun to see that. Another email I just got today, somebody is going to uh, use it in their training of their team. And they've given one lesson to each of the team oh, members. That's wonderful to hear. And and then uh, Eric Feldman, the Feldman oh, you know, sure. is going to be teaching uh, school, uh, some class in some university, and he's going to be using the book. I really think it gets at some really uh, difficult esoteric uh, uh, things that are tough to answer, as I'm trying to answer today. <laughs> well, it's written in bite-sized, digestible nuggets that you can really have a discussion around each one of these chapters. But Roy, speaking about the book, I mean, you retired from the SCCE and the HCCA. Now you're on a book tour, and it's great to have you here in New York. Um, why didn't you just take some time to smell uh, the roses, so to speak? I, I really was thinking that going to three-quarter time and be advisor to Jerry, who's just doing a fast, fantastic job as the new CEO of mm -hmm. SCCE and HCCA, it would be easy and behind the scenes and quiet. And it was for a few months while I wrote the book. And then I realized that once the book done, it gets evaluated. And I, if I don't go talk about it, it won't be sold. And I, I, I miscalculated, I, mu I must uh, say. I've also joined the advisory board of a, a small uh, a company named Osprey Compliance Software and uh, a couple other things. But March 24th of next year, I go three I go from three quarter time to n no time. Uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody, and and at that point, uh, th things will get a lot easier. Okay. Well, have there been any surprises since you published the book? You talked about a couple of examples of how it's being used, <laughs> but anything that you just said, wow, that, I didn't even think of that when I wrote it. I sent the book out to a bunch of people like yourself to get quotes. I read the quotes to put in the book so that people would think it was a good book. Luckily, people wrote nice things about the Thank book. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I read the quotes, and uh, I didn't really intend the book to be as the way we described a few minutes ago. Right. I just had some fun. And I tried to teach also. I tried to share things that I think would be helpful, but I didn't really have an intent. The instruction was to me from the head of our publishing department to share the history and stories of this period. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't just talk about me the whole time, although I did share some of those. I, I tried to use those to launch into oh, something sure. a little more meaningful than just talking about all my stories. And the point being is that when I read all the stuff and I saw people using it in training and book clubs and schools and things, I, I realized that I had hit a mark I hadn't even tried yeah. swinging for is to explain, and you said it once when we were talking earlier, I wish I would have written it down. I kind of tried to hit that that lane or that subject matter that is so infrequently discussed. Right. It's the goo that holds the whole compliance program together. It's kind of indescribable. Uh, you, you've kind of got to do it in a little strange way like all these lessons. But that was the biggest surprise is that the book wasn't just a historic reference book or something. It, right. was, it, it, it became a way to describe the things that go beyond the rule of law and how to audit and investigate and some of the other things that have been covered quite heavily, actually. Giving us discussable moments, <clears throat> teachable moments, learning moments. That's wonderful. <coughs> so let's talk about one of the concluding chapters, the Compliance Professionals Credo. Now, there are 29 of them. So Roy, and you describe them as elements of, that a compliance professional should commit themselves to. Give me your top three. Oh, this is just... <laughs> So uh, cruel. Um, my compliance program will utilize all seven elements of a compliance program okay. to prevent, find, and fix ethical and regulatory problems. Number two would be 
My compliance program will cover all risk areas of the organization. And, and the, those, those, kinda, those two are kind of easy. The third one would have something to do with, with uh, <clears throat> empathy. You know, just that I'm there to help the people stay out of trouble as opposed to discipline. Yeah. I can't remember the wording exactly. Well, Roy, that's very helpful. Um, for <coughs> compliance leaders, um, for even commercial leaders, as sort of a magnet to get everybody talking about these <coughs> very difficult subjects together. I think this is a wonderful book. And Roy, you've been so generous with your time and sharing it with us today. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to continuing to make the difficult, the discussable with you. So um, what's next for you? I, I would love to do this again. I've enjoyed this much. I'm writing in a, a, a book on integrity. Okay. And uh, as a matter of fact, on the plane out here today, I was writing the section that I would like some help specifically uh, from you with. It'd be an honor. Uh, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be back. Terrific. We'll look forward to it, Roy. Thank you. Thank you, sir.